Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I'm chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, October 11th, and we will be hearing the presentation Integrating Urban and Regional Sustainability Planning. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those into the chat box located in the webinar toolbar, and uh, we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, I ask, because there are so many of you on the line today, uh, to help me uh, facilitate these questions. If you could please type in who you want to answer the question, just so when I'm categorizing, uh, I can easily do so. I would appreciate it. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2019. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by three of our EPA divisions, the International Division, Regional and Intergovernmental Planning, and uh, Sustainable Communities Division. So thanks to this trifecta for getting this webcast uh, up and available. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by heading over to our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. Uh, and to check that out, go ahead and uh, visit our webcast webpage again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And to log today's CM credits, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And then you can search either by today's title or event number. Uh, and both of those can be found again on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Let's be friends. Like us on Facebook, planning webcast, uh, to receive up-to-date information on our sessions and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have over 2,000 subscribers and over 300 videos for you to watch. So subscribe, click our red button so that you can be in the know when we're posting our new sessions, which we are recording today's session and it will be available on our YouTube channel at the conclusion. And um, we will also have a PDF of the presentation available on our webcase, webcast webpage at the conclusion of our session. So with that, uh, I'm gonna get us started because we have quite the agenda today. So uh, I am going to turn it over to Tim Van Epp who will kick everything off for us. Tim, take it away. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you for organizing this and providing the platform. It's a very helpful service for all of the divisions and uh, chapters. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, the title is Integrating Sustainability Planning at the Urban and Regional Scales. Uh, we have a subtitle, um, which is um, kind of the motivation for this, which is to develop a, a new regional agenda as opposed to the new urban agenda and a new sustainable development goal, number 18, to make regions inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Hey, Tim, could you put it in, um, from beginning, could you put it in presentation mode for me? Thank you. That's what I needed to do. Okay. Beautiful, thank you. So this is actually a presentation that this group made at the uh, San Francisco uh, planning conference in April. And we had such good feedback that we thought a broader audience that uh, would be available by webinar um, would make sense and be helpful. So we have two categories of learning objectives, overall uh, learning objectives and, and objectives that are very specific to the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, ge in general, our most important objective is to understand the stated and potential roles of regional planning in the sustainable development goals and the new, new urban agenda, to appreciate the different roles that regional planning plays in sustainable urban planning 
as illustrated by different organizations, initiatives, and methodologies used internationally and in the US, which is what our four speakers will be addressing, and find out how sustainable regional and urban planning are, can be, or should be integrated. Um, again, there are some very specific goals in general, I went to them uh, in specific, you can read them later, but um, we'd like to create this new regional agenda, a new SDG 18, uh, which would be backed up by a paper that we might call the region we need, um, as opposed to the city we need, which was already developed um, pursuant to SDG 11, to uh, create an enabling environment for regional planning and uh, integration of regional planning and urban planning for sustainability and in general put regions on an equal footy, footing with cities and nations in partnerships language in the sustainable development goals in the new urban agenda so we have um, a, a star-studded cast here um, after me bruce deftel professor at georgia tech will present um, the un habitat organizations international guidelines for urban and territorial planning. Um, <clears throat> and following him will be Vincent Rashika. We'll talk about climate resilience related methodologies for integrating um, regional and, and urban planning. And um, that will be followed by Scott Edmondson of the city of San, Fran San Francisco planning department. Uh, who will talk about biophilic city planning and other nature-based solution methodologies. By the way, I'm sorry, Vincent Rashika is with Arup. Um, and then lastly, Sharon Rooney of the uh, Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division will talk about um, the nexus of water and, and resilience planning. <laughs> there are some questions you might keep in mind as you listen to the speakers. Um, we hope to preserve uh, 30 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, do you know of examples where the presented planning methods have been implemented? Were they successful or not? Are regional and city planners and designers and their organizations aligned and coordinated on sustainability and resilience planning? Should U.S. planners and designers align their sustainability planning with the U.N. Habitat Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, number 11, the New Urban Agenda? Should we push for formal development and adoption of some form of new SDG 18 uh, uh, covering the new regional agenda? And then lastly, um, we created this matrix, um, which you could um, fill in on your own um, afterwards um, as a means of sort of reviewing everything you've heard, um, which would erase the different kinds of planning methodologies which arose in this matrix with um, these various questions and parameters across the top. <laughs> so with that, I will turn it over to Bruce Stiftel, who will talk about the UN Habitats guidelines. As an expert, because he was involved in it. Thank you, Tim. Let me get my screen set up and uh, I'll be. Okay. Hello, planners. I'm Bruce Stiftel. I, I'm with Georgia Tech and APA's International Division. And I want to take you back to 2016, just about this time in October, to the Agora in Quito, Ecuador, when Maria Duarte, who was co chair of the UN Conference on Human Settlements and Sustainable Development, the so-called Habitat 3 Conference, turned to the 3,000 people in the room representing every UN member state and asked if there are no objections, it is so decided, and she slammed the gavel and this room of 3,000 people jumped to their feet. It was an extraordinary moment. I was really privileged to be there and to, and to feel the excitement and to see what was going on, but the, without any nation voting against it, the United Nations adopted the New Urban Agenda, a document of some 128 paragraphs that lays out a UN vision for what cities should be doing to respond to the challenges of rapid urbanization and, 
and population growth and environmental protection and economic development around the world. Um, I think that um, some of the motivations for uh, the new urban agenda are things that you're familiar with, but I'm to be sure that we set the context well, I want to review a few of the, the, the urbanization trends in the world with you. So first I'll say that um, we are projecting, the UN is projecting, that the world population in cities will, will move from 55% urban today to about 70% urban by mid-century. And that that is going to be close to a doubling of the city population of the world. Uh, a, a doubling that I have to say we're really not very well prepared for. Um, amongst those, um, amongst the urban, amongst the world population today, we have almost a billion people who live in informal settlements or what you may know as slums. We have about a billion people who lack reliable supplies of potable water. We have about two and a half billion who lack reliable sanitation services. The UN is projecting about 200 million climate refugees by mid-century. And when we think about inequality, well, we think that about three quarters of the world's cities have a, a greater amount of income inequality today than they did two decades ago. So the urban challenges facing our world are enormous. The, the graphic that you see in front of you comes from the University of Toronto, where um, uh, researchers are projecting that uh, two African cities are going to have more than 80 million people by the end of this century. They're projecting that Lagos and Kinshasa will be more than 80 million people each. And as you can see, they're projecting another half a dozen cities that will have more than 50 million people, including Dar es Salaam, Mumbai, Delhi, Khartoum, Maimay, Dhaka, and Calcutta, and Kabul. Um, the, the, the enormity of the challenge of how we think about making a city of more than 50 million people work is just is mind boggling. Um, for those of us who work in metropolises of maybe three or five or 10 million, um, and we know the, the tremendous challenges that we face in those places, how do we begin to think about properly organizing and servicing uh, a city that's 50, 60, 70 million people. Um, looking at those challenges, um, the UN has, over the past decade, been very active in thinking about what it can do to promote quality development and quality urbanization. And I have to say the, the logic behind this and, and the UN concern about development goes back to the founding of the UN in the 1940s, the logic behind this is if we don't have quality development, we won't have peace in the world. Because if people are fighting over resources and scrambling to get their little bit of the pie, um, the chance of having global peace is really very, very uh, little. And so in the last decade, the UN has adopted a series of, of accords or agreements that speak to questions of development. And I've got a list of the the big five uh, in, in front of you, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Climate Accords, of course, that you're familiar with from the headlines, the Addis Ababa Accord on Financing for Development, um, and then I'm going to skip to the bottom, the Sustainable Development Goals that, again, you've heard of that were adopted in 2015. Um, these are each getting at a piece of the challenge that we face with rapid urbanization. Um, and in addition to those four agreements, in 2015, the uh, Governing Council of UN Habitat adopted a document called the International Guidelines on Urban and Territorial Planning, which is going to be the focus of the rest of my comments today. Um, I'll, I'll say that the adoption of, of the Sustainable Development Goals was a radical departure from the system that had preceded them. The Millennial Development Goals that were adopted by the UN in 2000 uh, that had a 15-year time horizon were um, nowhere near as broad in scope 
as the Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted in 2015 with a time horizon of 2030. And most importantly for us as city planners is SDG 11, the Sustainable Cities Goals goal. And I, I, I can't underscore enough how controversial it was and how challenging it was to get SDG 11 adopted. What, what I've come to learn from working with you in Habitat is that in many nations, the division between the national government and the city leadership is quite profound. National leaders will often see cities as uh, city leadership as being potential challengers in the future. Um, but also, the, the professional networks that are involved with the substantive silos of transportation and water and disaster and, and so on, the various ingredients that we work with as planners all the time, those professional silos are very strong. And when the UN started to discuss having a potential sustainable cities goal, uh, many of those professions saw it as a challenge to their own work. And I think you can probably relate to this in the context of uh, the, the challenges that many US city planners face in working with the line agencies in transportation and highways and schools and um, hospitals and public buildings and et cetera, et cetera. Um, those differences of perspectives and vision are, can be quite uh, challenging to work with. Well, uh, in 2013, UN Habitat in, in the, the run-up to Habitat 3 wanted to prepare a set of guidelines that would help national governments around the world think about how they should do urban planning. And they put together an expert group of some 40 people drawn from uh, more than 25 countries around the world, almost all of them urban planners, uh, to imagine what kind of a planning system was necessary and was productive for responding to the challenges we face. And um, that process, a little over two years in length, led to a proposal for international guidelines on urban and territorial planning, which was put in front of the Habitat Governing Council in April of 2015, uh, about um, a year and a half prior to Habitat 3, and was adopted by the Governing Council. And those guidelines, if you haven't looked at them, are quite remarkable, and I really um, suggest that you download a copy from the UN Habitat website. Um, it, they are available in some 11 languages. The English version has been downloaded now more than 105,000 times. I'll say that again, 105,000 times. It is the most downloaded document in UN Habitat history. And it lays out an idea of what urban planning ought to be like in, in the UN's mind in every country around the world. Um, the, the, the designers recognized that the contexts were different in different countries, the resources were different, but they wanted to provide a, a schema that national leadership could use to think about what should a planning system be like, how should it be organized to be most effective. And um, that those guidelines are based around um, three enabling components, 12 principles, 114 action-oriented recommendations involving five different levels of government and four stakeholder groups. So the guidelines imagine that planning should be done at the neighborhood, city, regional, national, and supranational level. Supranational being um, uh, international compacts uh, like we have with Canada and with Mexico and other regions of the world have. And I, and I like to point out that, um, you know, each country has its own challenges at different levels. Here in the United States, we do not have a national urban policy. The guidelines say that every country should have one. Um, you know, whether we're going to do it or not is the question that, uh, that we could talk about. But my point is that nobody's perfect on this system. The guidelines imagine four stakeholder groups, national governments, local governments, planning professionals, and civil society organizations. And they think that all of them have specific and unique roles in carrying out a planning system. The guidelines imagine 
that there are three enabling components, rules and regulations, planning and design, and municipal finance, and that all three are essential components of a well-functioning planning system. Um, and finally, they imagine 12 principles. And uh, let me slip to the next slide, which shows you some of the, um, the high-level summaries of what those principles involve. Integrative and participatory decision-making, local democracy, adequate aims to realize adequate standards of living, um, uh, planning as a precondition for a better quality of life, as a catalyst for sustained and inclusive economic growth, promoting better connectivity, protecting natural and built environment, increasing security, um, as a continuous iterative process, um, as something that translates political decisions into action, that requires political leadership and involves monitoring capa sufficient capacity and uh, sustainable financial mechanisms. So this is a really robust and ambitious design. Uh, one of the members of the expert group that advised this process um, said, you know, if, if we take planning systems from countries where the median income is $30,000 a year, and we try and implement those systems in countries where the median income is $1,000 a year, we're going to fail. $1,000 economies cannot mimic $30,000 economies and what they take on and what their ambitions are. But the, the expert group had the idea, and UN Habitat adopted the vision, that we ought to be laying out an, an ideal process so that individual nation states could then make their own decisions about which of those planning components they wanted to adopt. I'm going to leave you with a picture of the expert group taken at one of their meetings in Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, I think this one in 2014. And uh, I will go ahead and circle my own uh, uh, head in the back of that picture. Um, it was really a, a, an honor to be part of that process. And now I am going to uh, pass uh, our webinar over to Vincent Rashika, and he will take the next uh, component. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, changing pace a little bit, I'm going to talk about some um, mostly US-based examples of federal and uh, international programs that have sought to address um, resilience and sustainability, um, both at the city scale and beyond the city scale, and what role um, regional planning has, has played in that process. Apologies. There we go. So when we think about cities, um, it's important to remember that uh, our cities and, and our urban places are made up of a con complex web of urban systems. Um, these systems typically include natural environment like our wetlands and fisheries, our, our built systems like transportation infrastructure, as well as um, non-physical systems like our cultural business uh, and environmental and governance structures. Um, when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about nurturing these systems. And when we talk about resilience, we're talking about protecting them. Um, however, when we think about natural systems, they're often overlooked, um, particularly when, we, when we're talking about what extends beyond the city's boundary. Um, in urban areas, we import a lot of our goods um, and we consume them in, in exchange for services, and then we export our wastes. Um, a lot of these processes are largely hidden from the view of urban dwellers. Uh, so just wanted to highlight a few um, guiding principles that Landscape for People, Food, and Nature um, identified as part of being important for the urban-rural framework. Uh, number one is urban and surrounding areas have shared space and resources. Number two is that uh, our urban and rural stakeholders have different entry points to advance 
sustainability and resilience goals. <clears throat> and the third is that creating common understanding of these shared risks and opportunities can help coordinate our planning efforts. Um, but it's common to, to first think about uh, resilience and sustainability planning um, purely in the context of hard infrastructure and uh, what kind of what kind of um, infrastructural systems we need to survive as a city, thinking about seawalls or roads and, and highways, things like that, wastewater treatment systems. Um, but the strength or, or robustness of our physical infrastructure is really only one component about what makes a place sustainable or resilient. Um, we need to ensure that people are, are involved in the process. Um, we need to be reflective about where each place we're, we're working in, um, where they're coming from, what their experiences are. We need to make sure that there's redundance in systems. So if a system fails, um, there's some sort of backup in place uh, ready to, to take up the load. We need to be thinking about um, the resources that we are using. Um, when we take something out of the ground, are we really making sure that we're being the most efficient with it? Um, and ensuring that flexibility, which I think is one of the most important characteristics at this stage is, are we able to adapt to the future climate or, or future hazards that we expect? And then of course, making sure that we're integrated with other planning processes, stakeholders, and um, and design processes. Um, so there's a, there are plenty of reminders um, that show us, you know, how intertwined our systems are, and um, they 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 typically come up when we least expect them. Um, so in in urban areas. Uh, we're, we're beginning to see a lot of impact on suburban and rural areas and vice versa. Um, this is an example of in 2003, there was a bushfire, um, a, a series of bushfires across the Australian Capital Territory. Um, and the local authorities were unable to predict the path of the fire. So they had no choice but to allow it to burn its course. Um, one week later, the flames reached the outskirts of Canberra, the capital. Um, and engulf the city's water supply and sewage treatment plant, as well as um, hundreds of houses. These fires affect the population for years to come um, and and really um, impacted how how they uh, the community survived going forward. Um, these events are increasingly common, especially with climate change. And of course, uh, at the same time, in Australia as well as in the u s, more people are, moving out of cities um, into rural and suburban communities. So this this slide is really just to point out that, you know, while we, we talk about the importance of regional and metropolitan planning, um, even at Arup, uh, we, we try to do the right thing. Um, sometimes we get overly focused on our cities because of how much happens here. Um, so we need to make sure we're always thinking about expanding the boundaries uh, beyond our, our political boundaries. So how do we address this imbalance, imbalance and focus? Uh, we have to bring nature back into the conversation and discuss it in tandem with our human needs. By embracing nature, we're inherently looking beyond the political boundaries that we've created and considering natural and human flows that connect us to surrounding areas. Um, of course, this is not really a new concept. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin Academy was built to address nature and integrated into the sloping landscape rather than sitting on top of the hill and um, really opening itself up to nature as opposed to the road. And Ebenezer Howard's, Howard's uh, Garden City sought to create a slumless slash uh, smokeless city, um, a concept that had been re repeated in various formats throughout history. Um, of course, acknowledging that there are inherent uh, inequities in some of these previous examples too. But in, in talking about this tension, um, it really takes a new importance in the age of climate change as the boundaries between 
quote unquote our world um, or the urban areas that we inhabit and their world um, or rural and more natural areas are blurred, um, especially when natural world invites itself back into the places that we've tried so hard to remove it from. Uh, this is an example of what is now called uh, sunny day flooding, um, where communities are uh, experiencing floods uh, through their infrastructure systems. And it's not just about connecting, um, learning from nature, it's about connecting people to nature and vice versa. What is most important in the process is that we build on the resources that we have for this learning process. Uh, we're not gonna simply abandon the areas of high risk because we all have built-in risk thresholds and some are, are higher than others. That said, we, ha we, we do have to uh, improve our resilience and preparedness for future change. So one of the things I think that we're starting to realize is we have to start talking about growth and development um, and adaptation through a risk-based lens. Essentially, uh, residents are, are concerned with today and tomorrow. Our developers are concerned with short-term profit and policymakers are thinking about what they can get accomplished in the next few years. However, um, when we look at risk profiles, they tend to increase over time. Um, and they and they really kind of the time frames are much longer than our uh, personal or political ones. So we need to start thinking about uh, solutions that are adaptable and can be built upon to manage risk over a continual process. And in thinking about the um, link between sustainability and resilience, the risk-based approach does not sell out our future generations on short-term profit, and instead distributes these costs. To, costs across a longer um, time horizon, connecting all generations with resilience and sustainability thinking. So uh, what are we doing about it here? I'm gonna just talk about a few different um, programs and, and projects that we've been involved with at different scales. So um, 100 Resilient Cities is a, is a um, program through the Rockefeller Foundation, Foundation um, that is focused on conducting an assessment of um, cities and then helping the cities develop resilience plans. Um, the process they use is called the City Resilience Framework, which Arup developed in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation. While the program uh, started off as being city focused, it also encouraged partnerships between universities, regions, and neighboring cities to accurately gather and report data. And new partnerships um, between cities are starting to emerge uh, to solve similar problems or address similar hazards. For example, 80% um, of the cities in the, Rock of, in the 100 Resilient Cities network um, highlight flooding as a major threat, and 20% address water security. The UN World Water Report highlights that, that there's a need for nature-based solutions to these issues. Um, and one place in particular, Semarang, Indonesia, showed us that there's, a, there's value in working together rather than against natural systems and um, bringing, thinking about protection of, of lives and providing state, sustainable li livelihoods is, is um, important to address in tandem. Um, so New York Rising was another program uh, that was funded federally and implemented through the New York State Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. Um, the, the program identified uh, around 40 to 50 communities across the state that had been uh, continuously exposed to, um, to hazards, in, in this case, particularly hurricanes. Um, we worked with five communities on the south shore of Long Island. And um, I think the most important thing we found throughout this process is uh, people's relationship to their land is linked to their time spent living there. And um, in many places, uh, the history of the land and seed, it doesn't, extends beyond human settlement, but um, it's kind of, a, we've made it invisible to the people who live there. Um, and people don't associate the, the systems that they're living in with uh, fa being factors in their lives because we've made it invisible. So um, when we went through the planning process with 
the communities here. Um, we showed them a map of where the storm, where, where Hurricane Sandy um, flooding impacted their communities. And then we showed them where, where in their communities there used to be wetlands and um, the areas where those wetlands were now turned into residential development. The, the lines of those three things kind of overlapped and it really opened people's eyes up to nature-based solutions and really embracing the history of the land um, and trying to, to redevelop a lot of these places into wetlands as opposed to housing. Uh, Rebuild by Design was a similar program funded by the federal government across the uh, New York City metropolitan area. And um, on this project, we were working with communities in on the South Shore um, or mid coast of New Jersey. And our community spanned uh, the barrier islands as well as the inland communities too. Um, the barrier islands for New Jersey, uh, for better or worse, are a key economic driver for South Jersey. So um, it was important to consider that in the process. While we expect that there, there will be a time that they will no longer be habitable, uh, we need to create a pathway to connect the barrier beach communities back to the mainland. Our plan pros, proposed to do so through um, transportation connections, developing ecological districts on the inland side, and um, connecting residents on either side of the bay so that in the eventual future where people needed to move back or migrate uh, further inland, um, they would have social networks of able to do that. The last of the major programs I'm going to talk about is Resilient by Design. Um, and this is a similar program to Rebuild by Design, but um, it was focused in the Bay Area of um, California. Um, and when you think about resilience, it's it's important to think about for who um, equally uh, with the design problem. Um, the program itself was uh, was, de was designed to address physical, social, and ecological vulnerabilities around the Bay, um, although many of the design solutions were really focused on physical responses to sea level rise and flooding. In working with the communities um, there, we, we discovered that the pro throughout the process that many of the most vulnerable communities around the Bay um, had much more pressing issues, including housing affordability and cost of living. Uh, these stressors are front of mind for people impacted um, by them and, and addressing them are arguably more impactful in terms of building community resilience and sustainability. Moving down to the uh, to the project scale, um, we've been involved in a project in Chengdu in China um, where we were developing a master plan for a new district outside of the city's boundaries. Um, as we went through this process, it was important for us to stress that um, this is not an urban area. It's not built up. So uh, we need to make sure that we're addressing natural flows and, and flooding patterns as well. And so we were able to bring uh, the concepts of nature and people together by developing floodable open space. This concept uh, allowed for a 365 day use of the space while acknowledging that flooding will occur and, uh, and, and made sure that people would still interact with the place when floods were happening. And the last example I wanna highlight is, in, is back in Australia um, and related to bushfires as well community called Narbathong um, was devastated by the Black, Fire, Black Friday fires in Victoria. This was a small timber community um, and it lost its community hall, which was the heart of the village. When I say small, I'm talking like less than 100 people. Um, so this community hall was really important to them. It was where people would get married, um, celebrate births and, and come together to grieve. Um, knowing that, that rebuilt, the rebuilding needed to meet upgraded code requirements, but wanting to work with the community to understand what they wanted out of the new building, we helped um, them design a structure that reflects the importance of timber, uh, connects users and passers-by with the natural setting, and, and meets the higher 
bushfire attack standards. Thinking back to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin example in the er earlier slides, uh, this is an example of what we can accomplish when we bring together community, history, um, social value, and environmental awareness. Uh, so in closing, I just want to share a great example of how we sometimes miss the mark when it comes to planning for resilience and sustainability and challenge us all to remember this as we go back to our desks. In, um, in a, a podcast called 99% Invisible, uh, Eric Kleinenberg was talking, he's an author of a book called People, uh, sorry, Palaces for People. He's, uh, he recounts a discussion he had with Rebuild by Design Team following Superstorm Sandy. They said they, they, they had this great idea to build something called a resilient center. It would be a nice building in a vulnerable community and it would be open as much as possible. It would be spacious. It would have flexible uses and it would be staffed with uh, people who were aggressively welcoming. It would have programming for kids and older people. There would be Wi-Fi for caretakers and it would be an amazing new institution. Eric's response was, wow, that's amazing. Have you ever heard of a library? Oftentimes, um, as planners and designers, we feel the need to start from scratch, to build something new and exciting that's never existed before. Um, and there's even more to temptation to do so after a major disaster when uh, rebuilding money comes in. But we just need to remember that we have the tools that we need. We can bring new ideas and concepts to our existing social infrastructure and really improve our preparedness and response to natural hazards in the process. We just need to take the time to reconnect people in nature. All right, so that's the end of mine. And I'm going to pass it off to Scott in a moment. There you go, Scott. Great, thank you, Vincent. I'm very pleased to be part of this presentation today, and <clears throat> I will be talking about um, the case of biophilic city planning in this topic of integrated urban and regional planning. My name is Scott Edmondson. I'm with the San Francisco Planning Department, and we were one of the uh, founding um, partner cities of the Biophilic Cities Network. Uh, the key question for me today is really, do we need to integrate urban and regional sustainability planning for success with this new regional agenda or possibly even a new sustainable development goal that uh, Tim mentioned and that Bruce elaborated upon? Really to make city region human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So today I'm going to talk briefly about, a, go through an introduction, a brief description of biophilic city planning. Um, illustrate it with a few practice examples, connect it to regenerative urbanism, and close with a few concluding points. So biophilic city planning is best understood as a new planning practice that integrates nature into the city to enhance public health and make better places. It's not a sustainability method per se, but it has become a core component of sustainability planning. And we're doing this work now in the context of an expanding challenge. We have a higher bar from the UN Habitat 3 New Urban Agenda and SDGs, but without a whole set of new tools to really rise uh, to the performance levels we need. And we're facing accelerating unsustainability trends. And in the face of these two, um, two points, uh, a question emerges for me of, will current practice get the job done uh, at all, if, and, and will it get it done in time? If not, what's a planner to do? What's the next big sustainability step uh, that we need to take? Fortunately, the response is emerging organically and in innovation occurring across our professions. In planning, we're planning for high performance places and beginning to embrace biophilic design and planning. In urban design, they're adding water and habitat, biophilia, for next generation placemaking. In architecture, they're beginning to explore living buildings. In landscape architecture, they're moving to uh, actual creation of high value habitat. And in utilities, 
even exploring the potential for living infrastructure. Regenerative urbanism has moved from theory to practice with cities advancing it with bold, innovative projects and plans globally. One might ask, what is this biophilic city planning, unless you're familiar with it? It arose over the past 40 plus years from the biophilic hypothesis of E.O. Wilson in the 80s, with his observation that humans evolved deeply connected to nature and the hypothesis that therefore they still require, we still require, direct experience of nature for positive identities, sanity, and health. And also noting that our realization of this need is weak and not reflected in a lot of our practice. And recent research over the last 10 to 15 years uh, continues to demonstrate benefits of uh, biophilic city planning. Now the architects picked up biophilic design in the 90s because it was a, they saw it, rightly so, as a new source of well-being, design well-being, and because humans spend 80% of their time in buildings. Timothy Beatley picked it up and extended it to city planning design in the 2000s because people need meaningful encounters with nature for public health and well-being beyond what planning and cities typically uh, provide. There are four pillars of biophilic cities and city planning. One is abundant nature. The second, pervasive citizen engagement. The third, deep nature culture. And the fourth, strong biophilic institutions at the municipal level. Biophilic urban design elements cross scales and planning and design needs to address this integration across scales. Biophilic design uses nature's forms and materials and views to create inviting and strangely familiar places that are comfortable and subtly attract us, that draw us in. Characteristics of biophilic neighborhoods include connecting people to nature throughout a lot of the different features, uh, using water for aesthetics as well as functional reasons, um, creating an abundance of nature in the different neighborhood uh, built spaces, including edible landscaping, abundant green areas, camping, etc. And these produce biophilic neighborhoods and cities that are full of nature, that invite activity, exploration, relaxation, and contemplation. And they stand in stark contrast to not the case where nature is absent. Out of the uh, International Biophilic Cities Research Program has grown this Biophilic Cities Network, which is a growing global network of cities advancing biophilic city planning and design, um, both cities as well as uh, individuals, um, academics, uh, practitioners. And they have a journal and a website and a whole host of resources uh, for use. So in this regard, we can consider biophilic city planning as one new tool to address the higher raised bar, planning bar of the new urban agenda, SDGs and sustainability success. And its approach is integrative and cross scale and supports this session's proposition of the need to integrate urban and regional sustainability planning for sustainability success. So we see a few examples uh, that have emerged in uh, biophilic city planning in San Francisco's planning projects. And I'm gonna cover a few briefly and a few in a little more depth. We started with Tim in the International Biophilic Cities Research Project uh, back in 2011 with uh, a, a handful of programs that we were pursuing at the time, one of which was our sister agency, SF Environments Biodiversity Program, which had just been launched. And its goals reflect the four pillars of biophilic cities, in particular, this new focus on expanding from ecological restoration as a traditional biodiversity environmental program to actually constructing nature in the built environment, which is a fourth goal of our program, and to construct this high value habitat in the built environment. Our urban forest plan was really an experiment answering the question of whether we could reproduce the aesthetic qualities, the dynamic functions and ecosystem services of a forest in cities for greater value and better places. We had a green connections uh, plan that was exploring how to connect people in nature uh, and they 
assembled a 24 root network, each with different habitat and species branding that directly connected people to nature along pedestrian and bike routes. We pursued a joint uh, department and International Living Futures Institute research project under a, one of their living city grants uh, focused on the question of how to make existing neighborhoods sustainable, which was a challenge we were facing at the time So those areas that would not uh, receive large investments of new money and new development. And we found the living community challenge and the, and the general approach of ILFI uh, really as a method for integrating local and regional sustainability planning around a living systems theme. And we noticed that biophilic city planning is part of this transformative regenerative method that requires changing directions by shifting from doing less bad or simply reducing impacts to doing good by eliminating impacts at their source, which is our economy, the current methods and processes of our economy. It involves shifting from our normal planning goals to living systems performance imperatives. In particular, we notice uh, under health and happiness, the ninth uh, imperative under the, living, uh, under the living community challenge is biophilic environment that's directly related to biophilic planning design. Now what we did with our research report is we put together a set of living community patterns um, modeled on Christopher Alexander's uh, patterns that were really sustainability, creativity, planning, de and design strategies that allow us to achieve multiple sustainability systems imperatives simultaneously in the planning and design moment, not as a separate analytic moment. An example is urban rewilding that allows us to embed nature deeply into cities in the built environment. Another is blue-green streets, which uses water and habitat for aesthetics, urban activation, and ecosystem services. And what one does is it takes a handful of the patterns that seem to apply to a particular um, problem or plan area and lay them, sketch them out onto the area and start using them to brainstorm ideas that one wouldn't necessarily consider otherwise. And in this way, develop a plan after wor working it a bit to enhance neighborhood sustainability with regenerative living system urban design using blue green streets and other living community patterns transform existing neighborhoods for sustainability success. And the question arises, do these examples add up to more than just biophilic city planning design? And I would argue that they do. There's a larger theme emerging and principle emerging in our work, which is really this idea of regenerative systems performance, which is a new integrative frame for sustainability potentially and, and, and integrates urban and regional sustainability planning with biophilic city planning design being a key. We took this newly emerging idea and tested it on a, one of our planning areas and, and to see what kind of new ideas and values it might create uh, with an eye to expanding them to the rest of the city eventually. One of those new ideas and tools was this urban system design palette um, to really design the integrated layers of regenerative systems performance where we add er water and habitat and metabolic integration to the traditional urban design palette to create next generation placemaking and regenerative systems performance. And this is really a new synthesis and a work in progress. The big four big ideas that we came up with, with are, which are essentially a biosystems mimicry, is district water, biophilic infrastructure, connecting across scales, and a circular economy. And the four of them really build a transformational value proposition. But this work, in my mind, is more than just city plus environment, good place, good environment. In the process of pursuing regeneratively planned design and functioning built environments, or the regenerative city region, we unwittingly build the spatial sustainability economy. And with this regenerative urbanism's economic connection, we, we expand the value proposition of our professions and even tremendously, substantially, as a game changer for planning, design, environment, and sustainability. From being a nice to have aesthetic value creator when you can afford it, and if it's not designed out, uh, cost engineered out, 
to being a must-have economic value creator and enabler of the sustainability economy that's the necessary basis for sustainable cities, regions, and, and, and world for sustainability success. And regenerative urbanism becomes the source code of that success, and planning potentially becomes the lead and the guide to that. Now, this idea is emerging full force in the literature these days in various syntheses in landscape architecture, planning, and sustainability. Nature and Cities is one of those books which I highly recommend. In that book, they chronicle the historical development and key practices and examples of this alternative ecological planning and design practice and theory. And one of the key co-evolutionary themes is this idea of creative fitting, where not only do species adapt to the environment competitively, but they adapt the environment to fit their, fit their needs. And the trick is that this must be done with regenerative effect, not degenerative effect as we do now. This theme is central to the emerging net positive living systems approach or regenerative urbanism. And the region is the right scale and crucial for creating and maintaining adaptive and regenerative landscapes and for successful ur urban sustainability planning. In conclusion, um, biophilic city planning and design is part of a profession-wide innovation that's occurring now, spontaneously, moving towards regenerative urbanism and integrated urban and regional sustainability planning for the purpose of capturing this greater value proposition of regenerative urbanism and sustainability success. If so, do we need a more intentional approach, whether or not formalized? And if you're interested, please continue to follow the International Division's work. And with that, I'd like to thank you and leave you with a couple questions. Is biophilic city planning and integrative regenerative urban regional sustainability planning a powerful new way of understanding sustainability, the end game, and how to get there? And is it potentially the next big sustainability step? And if so, do we need a new regional agenda and SDG 18? With that, I'd like to thank you. And I'm going to hand it off to Sharon Rooney. Here you go, Sharon. Okay, thank you, Scott. And um, I realize that we're kind of short on time, so um, I'm going no to No worries, move. Do your, you do your thing. Okay, I'm going, going to move um, uh, relatively quickly through um, my presentation to wrap up. Um, so um, the uh, APA uh, Divisions Council in 2018 awarded a product grant to the Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division um, to prepare a policy handbook on regional water planning for climate resilience. And uh, we had three, three goals for this project. First, to identify best practices or what we were calling actually promising practices in integrated water resource management and climate change to illustrate um, coordinated planning at various scales and highlight issues in different geographic and ecological regions. And the reason for undertaking this were um, a few of them. There, first, in 2016, APA issued a policy guide on water that um, emphasized the importance of water as an essential and organizing element in healthy environments, and that integrated water planning will increase our resilience to climate change but also that new mechanisms for interdisciplinary efforts are critical to manage water and protect the water environment. And that um, regional, in an, an APA poll in 2017, regional uh, is, was found to be the most appropriate geographic scope to examine that issue. And also this poll did recognize climate change as the most critical issue for our time. So in um, this policy handbook, um, and I'm going to go through several of these case studies, like I said, relatively quickly, but uh, we covered seven different regions, including um, Miami, Dade County in Florida, Cape Cod region where I'm from, uh, the state of Texas, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, San Diego County, not Ventura, I'm sorry, and the state of Oregon. So just to first cover the Miami-Dade County uh, case study, uh, this is a very rapidly growing region with a population of almost 3 million and a very tropical climate with over 60 inches of rain a year. 
but also at the same time, a very low elevation with only six feet above sea level and a very porous ground structure. And it's a very rapidly growing area. So some of the water and climate challenges um, include increased flooding, saltwater intrusion into their aquifers, increased evaporation from surface water, and as we're seeing everywhere, change in rainfall and change in hurricane patterns. So some of the one water challenges, and this is really central to the policy handbook that we describe um, and go into the one water um, practice and policy of APA, is that what we find across the country in the US is that there's a patchwork of jurisdictions. And in, in Florida's case, there's an absence of resiliency planning at the state level. So while they're facing this rapid urbanization and development, they have an aging water and sewer infrastructure system in Miami-Dade County, and they have multiple jurisdictions that have, um, have authority over water. Uh, so this slide shows the governance structure, and you can see it's very complex, um, including the South Florida, Florida Water Management District, my, the Miami-Dade County government, and the relative cities, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, yet at the same time, Florida has, and Miami-Dade County has made some progress in this area towards a one water approach to integrate their water systems. Uh, they have some evolving governance structures and the uh, Southeast um, Regional Compact on Climate Change is coordinating resiliency planning between the counties and municipalities. And there are also a number of uh, resiliency agencies at the municipal level. So there's a slow move in, in Miami-Dade County towards a more regional integrated approach towards water. And they are coupling that with the land use planning element to manage their water. So some of the um, examples highlighted in the report include um, blue-green infrastructure, including a mangrove restoration project, coral reef restoration work. Um, they have retention ponds for flood control, permeable pavement, and um, an interesting project is the restoration of the traditional Everglades water flow. Um, that's a including uh, water quality improvements, aquifer recharge, and habitat restoration. Now, secondly, the Cape Cod, Massachusetts uh, case study that I worked on, um, the Cape Cod region is uh, has a, an extensive amount of shoreline, almost 600 miles, yet, uh, as you can see from this slide, it's only 10 miles wide, um, with a population of over 200,000 year round, but this doubles in the summer months. Um, its ecoregion is primarily coastal plains and coastal pine barrens, and um, it has very permeable soils. So um, in, on Cape Cod, um, we have uh, an excessive nitrogen problem. Um, we have a lot of water resources. Um, they're all connected. We have um, over 50 embayment watersheds that uh, discharge uh, water to our coastal embayments. 32 of these are shared. They're shown in the, uh, the highlighted slide here. And 80% of the nitrogen that enters watersheds is from septic systems. So on Cape Cod, we have very little sewer systems. And 34 of these 52 are impaired uh, and require nitrogen reduction. So um, in um, 2015, the uh, Cape Cod Commission was directed to update a 1978 um, 208 report through um, the Clean Water Act, Section 208, and the Commonwealth uh, provided the commission with $3 million to update this plan. The approach was um, rather than rely on, on sewer for the solution, was to look at diverse technology and multiple solutions. It had a high degree of stakeholder engagement and was watershed based. One of the things that was unique about this plan is that uh, we developed a, an application, a tool, an online tool that assists the community and officials in creating the most cost-effective and efficient solutions to Cape Cod's wastewater problem. And this technology matrix, which is shown here on the slide, includes a menu of options at different scales for nutrient management. And many of these options, just to kind of get into the climate change issue a little, are more resilient. So especially some of the nature-based solutions that uh, we explored. 
And at the same time, the climate challenge on Cape Cod, um, while we expect only localized effects on water resources from sea level rise, um, we are experiencing today in Northeaster and Nor'easter, and we have um, significant erosion problems, storm surge, and more frequent storms, as many parts of the country are. And in addition, we have about $9 billion worth of property in special flood hazard areas. So this project, Resilient Cape Cod, was a three-year uh, three grant awarded to the commission and numerous partners to investigate uh, the environmental and socioeconomic um, results of coastal resilience strategies and a pilot program in one of our towns. So this um, a matrix was developed similar to the 208 plan that looked at various options for building resilience to climate uh, effects, um, including the do nothing scenario or things like beach nourishment, offshore reefs, um, various strategies ranging from hard solutions to more nature-based solutions. This is a screenshot of the, a tool that is being developed uh, by the commission where um, it allows the users to uh, zoom in on a particular area along the coastline, explore different strategies and the costs and economic benefits and costs of various strategies uh, from green to gray. Um, this next case study is the state of Texas, uh, which was uh, contributed by Mark Vandershaf, our former uh, chair of the Regional Planning Division. So um, this is again a very complex case study, complex state with high growth, um, 23 river basins and major aquifers, 13 of them, over 1,200 12, municipalities, numerous in industries and a variety of ecotypes. And again, as in Florida, has a very complex water management structure, including the Texas Water Development Board, who oversees infrastructure funding for 16 management regions, but also the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, who oversees some waters through um, 15 types of districts. So in all of these cases, um, there's a, regional planning for water is very complex and involves multiple jurisdictions, um, and a lot of integration is, uh, it's, it's very challenging. So some of their climate challenges are water shortages. Um, again, I think it's no surprise in increased frequency of weather extremes. They've also had record droughts and temperatures and extraordinary flood events. So this is a report that um, is very interesting, would be worth looking at um, in February, 2018. Um, was um, supported by the Mitchell Foundation. And this looks at a one water future. So while we didn't find that Texas was necessarily maybe the, the best practice uh, in terms of integrated water management for climate, um, there are efforts to move forward towards a more integrated approach. And there is increased funding that's going towards um, conservation activities. And so some of that funding is going towards more conservation minded activities in Texas. And there are some examples highlighted in the report um, about the San Antonio in particular example, um, where they're looking at uh, the recycled water delivery. The city of Austin has some promising, excuse me, practices. Um, Rebuild Houston is an interesting program using um, drainage and infrastructure, and then biogas production in Fort Worth. Uh, this next case study is uh, the Midwest, Minneapolis-St. Paul. Again, Mark played a big role in this um, case study. Uh, this is a metropolitan area um, and has 16 counties and over 3 million population. Um, and eco-regions, different eco-regions um, because of the size of the area. And in this case, the Metropolitan Council plans, owns, and operates a regional water wastewater system. Um, that serves the urbanized area. And it also has statutory authority for transportation, parks and trails, and review of local plans. There's really good coordination in the Twin Cities um, for water and other, other systems. The Metropolitan Council also has responsible, responsibility for overall water planning for the region with a special focus on drinking water 
and a network of 33 watershed management organizations that guide local comprehensive plans for surface water management. So some of the key issues in the Midwest or in Minneapolis-St. Paul, um, again, the climate change doesn't necessarily threaten the amount of water, but it, it, the um, water issues will be affected by more frequent and serious flood and drought cycles, warmer weather, um, and contamination of uh, water sources and groundwater is a big issue in Minneapolis-St. Paul. Um, briefly, the policy frameworks Metropolitan Council was created by the state legislature in 1967, and um, the council um, has, you know, tremendous authority over the water resources um, and develops plans. Some of the promising practices are, include a one water strategy, which is what we're striving for that unites wastewater, surface, and stormwater with groundwater and with um, specific regional local responsibilities within the different community designations. And they've included some extra funding via a legacy amendment to implement that plan. Moving forward towards the West Coast, the California case study, this features San Diego County and um, they have uh, the Mediterranean California ecoregion and um, San Diego is located in um, a basin that includes 11 different watersheds. So again, a very complex system here. And in California, um, the, some of the issues are limited surface water and groundwater, and again, a very rapidly growing area. And um, the region is also very susceptible to droughts, just went through a very serious one with um, changes in the timing and amount of, of precipitation and increased temperatures, and also you know, recently in the news, um, serious wildfire, wildfires, floods, and mudslides that um, have cascading effect in California. So um, again, there are sort of multiple jurisdictions that have authority for water resources management here, include, you know, so including all these stakeholders in the process, this is very key. Um, this is an interesting report that's highlighted in our handbook, the San Diego Integrated Regional Water Management Plan that takes an integrated approach to water supply, water quality, and habitat pr protection. It also promotes green infrastructure solutions, so uh, interesting to look at if you're interested in that topic. And the next update, I think that's already underway, will address the latest findings on climate impacts. And then lastly, the state of Oregon. Uh, we had several people from the state that contributed to this case study, very interesting one. Um, their first water strategy was adopted in 2012 using a statewide approach that integrated water quantity, quality, and ecological needs. Uh, it did account for coming land use pressures and growth, and it provided a framework for locally initiated place-based water planning effort. So this case study, um, again, the climate change uh, issues in, in Oregon, um, they're experiencing more frequent droughts and very interesting, in this case, the loss of snowpack, which is in transitioning to more rain dominant system. Um, they also um, have issues with their surface water is already fully allocated to users. So finding new sources of water or maintaining an adequate water supply is a really serious issue for the state of Oregon. And um, this case study talks about how the aquifers um, have already reached their limits in terms of withdrawals. So um, it's a very um, serious issue for the state. So um, this, this covers, uh, this slide here is talking about some of the history of the Oregon Water Code. Um, the uh, basin level water planning uh, started being conducted by the state in the 1990s, uh, but that ceased. And then uh, the first statewide water strategy was adopted in 2012. And that uh, led to this place-based planning approach in 2015 that, that the um, state is taking on in four different locations. So um, this is a locally initiated effort with state partners at the table 
and they're testing a set of planning guidelines, taking an integrated look at water issues. And um, they're assisted by the Climate Impacts Research Consortium. So they're providing current climate data. And that wraps up my presentation. Try to go fairly quickly through this. Um, if you would like a copy of the handbook, it's available at the division's website. The link is here, or you can contact me. Um, and that's actually not the right address, but Tim will have it on his slide. Right. So I'm going to turn it back to Tim. Sorry, Sharon, uh, I got the same email address as you had at the end of your presentation, um, your Gmail address. But it, uh, in any Just event- Just add a uh, J. <laughs> S.J. Rooney. Ah, okay. Um, so this is uh, email addresses uh, for all of us. Um, please feel free to uh, email us if you have um, questions that we don't have time to answer uh, today. Um, but uh, from here, I will turn it over back to Christine, who will um, manage the uh, Q&A session. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So we do, we have a couple questions here. We'll, we'll get through just a few of these. Um, and I'm going to give that screen back to you, Tim, okay. because I need you to keep it on um, just so if, in case folks need to copy right. down any email addresses or anything. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sharon, you're up first. You had mentioned changing hurricane patterns in your Miami day discussion. Uh, what are the changes in hurricane patterns? The number of hurricanes per year have not increased historically. Um, I believe it's the, well, the intensity of them um, is increasing. Um, I, I, you know, again, that uh, the, uh, while the number may not have increased, the intensity of them has been increasing. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. This is for any of you. Um, people in my area, which is deeply conservative, are concerned about anything UN related. Uh, how, how do we respond to this? Um, this is Scott Edmondson from San Francisco Planning. I mean, that's just a tough one. Um, ultimately, it just requires building trust and having that longer conversation. But in the short run, maybe the idea is to not lead with UN stuff, um, but lead with a focus on the issues at hand and innovative solutions and being innovative or just effective solutions. And then, you know, pull those from wherever without really labeling the source. I, can I add I that I think that's exactly, this is Bruce, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, we, we see the impacts of climate change on agriculture and on commerce and on um, coastal properties. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with those problems and, and rally people to talk about those problems and see how, what kinds of solutions they can manage to those problems. Right. This yeah, and is I guess your point about engagement, Bruce. You know, just in terms of one of the principles of the the territorial planning that guidelines, and that also that Vin, Vincent mentioned as well. Yeah, I was just about to mention just one of the characteristics of resilience places I mentioned was reflectiveness, and really thinking about what is happening in your specific community. I don't I don't know where it is, but presumably there is some sort of natural hazard that is getting worse, uh, whether it's um, coastal flooding, um, riverine flooding, stormwater damage, uh, hurricanes, wildfires. Um, there's something that's disruptive in, in all of our different places. And I think thinking about what is what will resonate locally and then what, what types of you know local community or economic um, components are really the focus for them. So, you know, there was a really good article in New York Times recently about um, the impacts of climate change on rural farming communities, and they don't really need the science. They don't need the UN to tell them. They can see it and feel it every day. So um, I think really just kind of 
making sure people are connected and anybody who is his is expressing doubt about um you know the 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 uncertainty in the future making sure they're connected and have a really good network of people to um express those issues and start to talk about solutions may i, may I, like I add that that um uh, partnerships with similar stakeholders in other countries can really be transformative you know if uh American farmers are connected to Brazilian farmers and French farmers and Chinese farmers and see how they deal with the, with the issues that they face. Um, in my experience, that uh, tends to, 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 to reduce the degree of fear about internationalization because people see that the others who are doing the same work they're doing and have the same interests that they have are experiencing uh, similar problems and are developing good ideas and good solutions that they could learn from. I'd also like to add that um, there is a program of um, pilot testing the SDGs in three U.S. cities, including New York, Baltimore, and um, um, San Jose, California. And uh, it's been going on for a few years. Uh, some of it's academics um, driven, um, but I believe um, the city departments are, um, the relevant city departments are collaborating, cooperating, and perhaps uh, program is, um, provides um, some methodology that could be used by other communities. Uh, again, you know, it depends on uh, the makeup of the community and how open they are to these kinds of things. Um, but if if they're sort of borderline in that respect, um, these methodologies uh, and, and the people behind them might provide a useful resource. Thank you. Um, next question. I, I'm asking if this has ever come up before as a possibility, but one person is asking with um, all the climate change that is happening um, and all the increased hurricanes, coastal flooding, ha has there been any discussion about perhaps not developing anymore in some of these areas or even, you know, thinking about people moving out of these, you know, flood prone areas or these more hazardous areas. You know, we talk about New Orleans and um, how folks are moving right back in. And there is a strong possibility that there will be another hurricane that will wipe out New Orleans, yet people continue to move there. Has there been discussion about trying to uh, move people out or, you know, decrease or slow down development in some of these areas. This is Sharon. Um, I'll I'll comment on the the Cape Cod uh, case study in the um, the NOAA Climate Resiliency Project. Um, there was a, a series of stakeholder meetings um, that were really well attended, and um, it was interesting that that was a topic that did come up. And this is in a region with. Uh, very high property values, and as I mentioned in my slide, you know, nine billion dollars of property along the coastline. So it was really interesting that people were willing to talk about that. Um, but that's a significant challenge um, in getting, you know, people to relocate um, because a lot of times people that are, you know, are in the most um, vulnerable areas don't have the ability to move somewhere else. Um, you know, that's not always wealthy people that are living along the coastline. So, but it was interesting that the topic did come up in the stakeholder workshops. Yeah, um, this is Vincent. Uh, this came up in New York Rising. Um, as part of the New York Rising program, there was a, a community-based resilience process and then a homeowners-based resilience process as part of the homeowners um, program there was there was an optional buyout um or, or acquisition program that community members could take part in um there are a lot of challenges with doing it you know some people have experienced multiple storms 
or their their homes are so severely damaged that they even if even with federal money um you know they don't want to take the risk of owning the home again that's fine but um at a community scale it's really important to think about you know what happens to people who are left behind you know sharon was saying some people don't have the financial means to move um some people are really attached to their their property as it might be the only thing that they they like own of of value um i know that the there's a community on long island called um mastic beach i think uh that is is currently looking at retreating a little bit um and building in some rebuilding some some natural systems to protect the rest of the community uh it really has to happen in a coordinated fashion across the community um there are there are more examples of riverine communities starting to do this now in and along the mississippi river um system and there are some examples in new orleans actually um and and miami now too but um you know it's it, it really takes a lot of effort and and money and i think in terms of thinking about the community the local communities yeah that that um impact of of tax revenue is really important to consider i do think that as planners we have we're in a position where we can be advancing the conversation about alternatives that have not been part of the discussion and um, and and even some alternatives that are audacious you know talk about relocating entire cities um, through urban realignment programs, um, as well as uh, massive public investment programs to protect and fortify existing coastal communities. Um, if, if we start to get ideas out there about what the possible responses might be, that I think will advance the degree to which public discussion uh, takes some of these uh, challenges seriously. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Bruce, in a couple respects, kind of going back to your point about 200 million climate refugees by mid-century, um, that starts to get at the magnitude of the problem. And I think it illustrates the point that our existing institutional capacities and policy capacities are not up to that scale of problem and issue, and that one of the challenges of sustainability and sustainable development is really innovating around institutional capacity and policies. Um, you know, thinking back to that slide that Vincent showed about the risk, uh, risk curve over time, business as usual status quo, you can't really have this discussion very well without realizing that business as usual is an increasing risk curve along these lines and others. And it really, responding effectively really requires stepping back, pausing, reflecting on that over time, and really developing a fundamentally new uh, approach. Uh, if we don't do it, you know, the insurance companies will do it for us because they're not going to continue to insure property and businesses, et cetera, that they view are in high risk places. So we should probably try to get ahead of it a bit. And I think we can. I would just lastly say, um, agreed to, agreed with all that but also um if if uh whoever asked the question is just looking for a resource i think the nature conservancy um has done some good work and then also the georgetown climate center um have have some good re reports on tools um and approaches to coastal realignment retreat adaptation whatever you want to call it um and thinking about the legacy of the land and making sure that it stays protected is another important um, uh, consideration because some of the places that where people have agreed to leave, um, they they did so under the promise that their property would not be redeveloped. And, and that we're starting to see some of that changing already in the New York area because, um, you know, it's been a few years since the hazard. Now people's, you know, people's memories are pretty short when it comes to uh, that impact. So, um, making sure that the land is not going to be redeveloped, it will be returned to nature, and there's a process to improve its um, protection for other, the, for the more inland communities. Yeah, nice points. 
Okay, I think I'm going to wrap us up. It's a little after 3.30 Eastern time. Um, this was a great discussion. Tons of questions came in. So folks, feel free to reach out um, to follow up with our presenters today. And just so you know, uh, Sharon, I did get a message from a couple of people saying that the link you provided um, was not working. So if you're able to send me an updated link, I can send it out to everybody. Um, so thanks to all of you, all of our presenters and our sponsors today for joining us and everyone will talk next time. Have a great weekend.